Hello watch lovers, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. My name is Stian and today we have a subscriber watch on the bench. This used to be uh, Tony's father's watch. You remember him uh, wearing it all the time, so it's got uh, a lot of use. And we'll see some of that uh, reflected in the watch as well, of course. The watch does not run, at least not uh, as it should. And uh, the chronograph doesn't work. Uh, the uh, quick set doesn't properly work. So there's a lot of small issues with the watch. And uh, well, when I say small, I actually mean big. Let's get back to that. The watch has a relatively typical uh, late 1940s, 1950s uh, design. Uh, Tony wasn't sure of uh, when the watch is from, but I would say it's from either late 1940s or uh, early to mid 1950s. See, so it's uh, got a gold plated case that's uh, seen better days. And that, of course, immediately brings us into uh, a little bit of a question what should we do with the case? In general, I would say that depends on what we do with the dial. And I think this dial is such a beautiful old dial that we don't want to touch it in uh, basically any way. And uh, discussing with Tony, he uh, also said that we should uh, keep the case. And I think that's uh, a good idea, to be honest. The issue with gold-plated cases is that you need to replate them. And uh, replating them is actually not going to be uh, very easy if you want to have it as thick as a watch should be replated. It's also going to be very expensive, so uh, most of the time you don't want to do that. So we got the case back off, and we see the watch actually did start running. Now, why did it start running? Was it because we took the case back off, or because we put the watch upside down? Now we see the chronograph also runs a little bit. So that's interesting. Oh, there it stopped again. So something definitely not good with the chronograph function. Let's have a little bit uh, closer look at how the chronograph uh, works. The movement is uh, Valjou 72C. One of the more complicated uh, old uh, chronographs. As you saw, it has a triple calendar. And of course, the chronograph uh, function. And uh, yes, it does look like uh, Tony's father did some gardening. At least there's a lot of uh, growth in the case of this uh, watch. And another sign is that the crown is completely stuck. Cannot get the crown out. So we're going to have to try to work around that. There are a few different things we want to do. We want to uh, create some space so that we can uh, perhaps see if there's anything blocking uh, the screw for the setting lever to release the crown. And we also want to be able to perhaps put in some uh, rust release, that kind of thing. But we see this screw is very stuck. Another thing with this uh, movement is that we don't have a movement holder that's uh, gonna fit in any reasonable way. So we're actually gonna use the watch case as the movement holder. The first thing we're gonna do, of course, is to uh, get uh, the dial and the hands off. And there are a lot of hands on this watch. These dials uh, are commonly secured with these uh, dog screws so that it's uh, secured from the underside of the movement rather from the side, so that uh, helps us in uh, this case. I think that dial just looks lovely with those old golden uh, numerals. So we're going to put the dial aside and then we can have a look at uh, the calendar mechanism. This is the corrector. 
and there should actually be a piece that also corrects the weekday. Somehow it's relatively common in this uh, caliber that you uh, find that the weekday corrector is not there. You see the screw is actually there, but uh, we'll see what we can do. Let's take the wheel discs. Wheel discs? Did I just say that? Yeah, I did. I say a lot of things. That's fine. Let's take the date discs off. Put them together with the dial and uh, this little protection box. There are a lot of screws in these uh, old movements and it's a little bit um, of a problem that they're actually not identical, even though they might look identical a lot of the time. But these old uh, movements have a lot of shoulder screws and instead of trying to keep track of them, we simply put them back in place. That way we're going to reduce the risk of uh, mixing up the screws quite a lot. And that's always helpful. A couple of these uh, levers have some very strong springs. So we want to be very careful with that. That especially goes for the date corrector that we'll uh, see in a second. And while I'm taking off all these uh, correctors and uh, jumpers, uh, I thought I would share with you everything I know about uh, Montrose which is the name on the dial, of course, uh, the watch brand. They were a watch brand and they are no longer. And that's all I know. There were so many brands back in the day and uh, most of them don't exist anymore. Some 70% of brands uh, went under. So uh, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, interrupting the history of the brand, we have this uh, big ass spring for uh, the date corrector. Be very careful with that one, or you're gonna ping some parts into uh, another dimension. Now, as I was already saying, there isn't too much to be said about Montrose as a brand, unfortunately. What can be said about this watch is that it was uh, certainly not a cheap watch. It's a well made watch, beautiful dial. And uh, the Volger 72C was a uh, very high grade movement. We do see that the years have taken its toll. And of course the lack of uh, servicing. So things move a little bit uh, slowly and uh, reluctantly. What we're working on now is the hour counting mechanism. A little bit uh, intricate way of doing it. It does work, but it's also a little bit prone to uh, some errors. We'll get back to that as we uh, put the watch back together. But there are some very finely teethed, uh, finely toothed, I suppose, wheels. And uh, you also have a couple of these uh, small uh, friction springs. I'm not showing that we put all the screws back in, but uh, you can see that in between the shots, I suppose. This is the lever that uh, transfers the action from uh, the train side to the dial side for the hour counting mechanism. Uh, this is the pinion that uh, connects with the barrel. The last part of uh, the calendar mechanism is this uh, little plate that serves as a platform for uh, the discs. And again, we're going to put the screws back in. We're going to take off the cannon pinion. It is friction fit, as is uh, most of the case with these uh, old uh, movements. Actually, always the case with this older movement. And we keep seeing uh, that some of the parts really do not want to uh, cooperate. And now that we've gotten uh, all the calendar parts off, we can use this uh, Schraubenlöser to try to uh, loosen up the rust. Because that's what it is that's uh, keeping this uh, stem from coming out. Normally we would then uh, go on to the train side and start uh, working there. But uh, given that we need to uh, try to get the stem out, we're also going to take off the keyless works parts. For this uh, setting lever spring, what we want to be careful with is to uh, grab it too much in the thin end. 
if you pry too much there, it's gonna easily break or bend. So we have to be very careful with that. Another peculiarity about uh, this movement are these two screws we see here. Nowadays you uh, would have small posts there instead of the screws. But it was probably easier to uh, manufacture screws instead of uh, posts in the plate. So that's likely the reason it's like this. So we see that uh, the stem does move in and out, but uh, we just cannot open the screw. So we're going to try it again from uh, the train side, but it is still completely stuck. So what we're going to do then is take off all the chronograph parts and gently oh, place them uh, safely somewhere. The chronograph is pretty textbook uh, column wheel chronograph. This uh, post here for the hammer is uh, actually screwed into the movement uh, plate. So a uh, good idea to check it. If it's loose, you're going to have problems uh, with the reset. Now, most of these parts aren't only screwed in place. There is also a couple of uh, steady pins underneath that uh, make sure the parts don't rotate on the screw and uh, stay in place. And they can be very tight, uh, especially for uh, 72C. I've found that to be uh, the case many times. And here we see the chronograph bridge was very, very tight, very difficult to get off. And what is that we see? Da, da, da. What we see is the result of not being careful when you take that uh, chronograph bridge off, the pivot on the chronograph wheel is broken off. So that would explain why we have some issues uh, with the chronograph function. So the question is then, uh, what do we do about that? And the obvious uh, answer is that we find a new one, if we can. Because this is a movement that hasn't been produced for uh, 50 years. So the parts you're gonna find have been stored somewhere for a long time. So let's uh, get back to that later. There are a couple of more parts on the chronograph side that uh, aren't too uh, cooperative. It is clear it's been a really long time since uh, this movement has been serviced. But it is a very high quality uh, movement, made really well. So uh, most of the parts still look pretty good. And apart from that uh, stuck crown and stem, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, rust uh, ingress either. We see this uh, jumper here for the intermediate date wheel doesn't want to budge, so we're gonna leave that for the moment as well. We can uh, press it out from the underside later. We're gonna use this uh, special tool to uh, pull up the driving wheel from the chronograph. And what's most special about that tool is apparently that it's uh, not visible. Sorry about that. One of the reasons uh, why we can say that this is an old movement. Well, that was kind of stupid. It's obviously an old movement. But uh, this one has a Breguet hairspring, so an overcoil on the hairspring, the balance spring. And that's something uh, that only the first few years of production uh, used. So most likely this movement was produced in the late 40s or uh, early 50s. You see there's uh, not a lot of uh, extra play actually. So that's uh, good to see. Again, uh, some of these uh, bridges are also quite stuck and given that we're working inside the case still, we don't have quite as many uh, paths to get it out as uh, we normally would. But this one also has an extended pivot sticking through it, so we want to be careful we don't break or bend that. The last plate we need to take out is this uh, three-quarter plate. 
slash barrel bridge and it was very stuck again there are no uh, extended pivots going through this plate so it's a little bit safer to pry it off but uh, still not a comfortable situation and we see a perfectly beautiful imprint of uh, the center wheel on the underside of the bridge there which means that uh, that center wheel has been staying put for a long 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 time you see the barrel also has some strange wear looks like it's been kind of filed uh, down anyway with the setting lever screw and the stem completely exposed we can finally really get to the screw and we can actually open it that's like uh, pulling a tooth that's been hurting you for years huh? even though it's more like 10 minutes quite a few of these parts are a bit rusted as we can see so we're gonna have to clean them up quite a lot among those is uh, the crown wheel it is completely stuck and i hope that's not rust and it's not rust just dirt come in oh no that was on the video So again, a lot of screws, so we want to make sure we uh, try to separate those. So Tony told me that uh, he remembers his father wearing the watch uh, a lot, but then at some point uh, either it didn't work properly or something happened, so uh, he stopped. And that was uh, quite a few decades ago already. And I think we're uh, seeing that back. Here we finally got uh, that uh, jumper for the intermediate uh, minute counter wheel off. Again, it's got such a thin uh, end, so we really cannot pull uh, in that. We're going to destroy it, but we could push it out from the underside. Before putting the movement uh, into the cleaning machine, we want to get the worst grime off it. Using this uh, pegwood uh, sticks is uh, really good uh, for a lot of that. And some uh, Swiss Play-Doh as well. We're also going to take uh, the shock settings out. So uh, this watch does have Inca block. Inca block was uh, invented in the mid 1930s, but it wasn't uh, really mainstream until uh, a little bit later. But you will find watches from uh, the late uh, 1930s and uh, from the 1940s uh, with Inca block. Not sure when uh, Valjo started using it, but uh, it should fit in with uh, the assumption that the watch is from the late 40s or early 50s. We see the mainspring is also of a very old kind, but a beautiful purple color. Look at that. It's really nice color. But it's not really... Uh, fit for purpose, as you might see. We put the balance back on and uh, we're going to take off uh, the shock setting there as well. Before we put uh, everything in the cleaner, let's go to work a bit more on some of these worst parts. And uh, as is very common, those uh, can be found around uh, where the stem goes into the case, into the movement. That's uh, the typical uh, place for water ingress. The setting lever stem, see it's uh, very dirty, but uh, with that uh, Schraubenlöser, it came off a little bit more. So in combination with that uh, chemical, we're then using a uh, glass fiber brush, which is uh, very useful. Worth noting that uh, most of this uh, rust isn't uh, deep at all. It is just on the surface. 
I'm going to see that later with this uh, setting lever screw that looks completely damaged. But it is actually going to be uh, nice and shiny again. And that's good because getting spare parts for a movement this old is not only uh, difficult, it's also very expensive. All right, we got all a uh, couple of hundred parts lined up. So let's get him into the cleaner. feeling of having someone or something else to work for you. That must be how bosses feel all the time, man. Eh? Or my wife. All right, while well, that's uh, simmering, let's do some gardening. I think it's moss. That's been uh, growing on uh, this case. At least it has a similar texture and color. I'm uh, not going to comment on the smell. But yes, there is a lot of it. We, of course, want to use uh, something that doesn't uh, damage uh, the plating. The plating is uh, damaged as well, of course, uh, but we don't want to damage it more. So that's why we're using uh, pegwood. The pushers we have to uh, unscrew. Just hope we can find the screws again. I mean, the old uh, gunk. So lately my wife has really been into the whole composting thing. And this uh, really makes me feel uh, part of that. The crystal is uh, pretty badly damaged. You see there's even uh, a hole or a missing piece or not missing, but a loose piece. Luckily that has not really uh, damaged the dial too much. Finding a new crystal is not a big uh, problem. But cleaning my desk after this might be. We're going to run this through the ultrasonic a couple of times. That might be enough to make it clean. All right, we've gotten the parts back from the cleaning machine. We're going to first fix this little dent in the barrel. Not exactly sure what happened there, but it looks like someone tried to file something off. So we're going to try to flatten it with our staking set. Dance to the rhythm, dance to the rhythm. Now, as uh, some of you might have guessed, we had to get a new mainspring. Somehow I didn't manage to get it on camera, but uh, when I took the mainspring out of the package, it didn't fit into the barrel, so I had to uh, take it out and put it in the mainspring winder. But there we are, with a new mainspring in the barrel. And some thunderclouds outside. some dogs outside as well.
barrel is very tight, but uh, we managed to get it in place. And uh, it is flat. It looks a bit uh, funky, but it is actually okay. For the cap jewels, we're putting on a tiny little drop of uh, Möbius 9010 in the middle. We want that drop to be about uh, half the size of uh, the stone. You can treat the cap stones, and uh, it's even recommended that you do so with uh, Epilam, so steric acid. Fixodrop is the most common uh, product name. We're going to use that for uh, the escape wheel and also for uh, the pallet fork. Put it in the, this little basket and then we put that basket into this uh, special and uh, very expensive jar. Which apparently they're not selling in a smaller uh, version with a built-in uh, basket for a much more reasonable price. So that's good. Then we can get uh, the shock settings back in and see if uh, the balance wants to uh, oscillate uh, nicely. A couple of things to uh, notice when you look at uh, this hairspring, it's a Breguet overcoil. So you can see it uh, opens up, breathes, if you will, uh, much more uniformly. But there's also something that doesn't look quite right here. So we're going to have to look at the hairspring in a bit more detail as well. But it does oscillate uh, quite okay for now. So let's get on with the assembly. I'm going to start with uh, the underside of uh, the three-quarter plate. That's where we have uh, the winding works. Remember that this crown wheel didn't uh, rotate at all. It was completely stuck. But after cleaning and with some uh, fresh uh, lubrication, hopefully that is uh, not a problem. And it looks uh, fine. Looks uh, shiny even. We're going to lubricate uh, all the different friction points and uh, one of those points or a category rather is uh, where you have springs uh, working on parts like this one so we're going to put a tiny little drop of uh, d5 or uh, hp1300 there now remember the setting lever screw this is how it looks after cleaning so it can be reused we put the barrel in first Put a little bit of extra oil around the arbor there. And given that uh, the winding works are on the underside of this uh, three-quarter bridge, we uh, first need to put that uh, ratchet wheel on top of the barrel. And then also the setting lever screw. This uh, fourth wheel goes uh, through the plate in both up and down directions. There's one uh, pivot for the second sand and uh, one for uh, driving the chronograph wheel. When we're putting on this uh, three-quarter plate, uh, what we want to be careful with is uh, especially the click, that we uh, don't uh, sort of jam that on top of the ratchet wheel, but uh, rather get it in the proper place, like that. Before we can see if uh, the train runs freely, we need to uh, put on the bridge. And then it should uh, run freely as soon as we get uh, the pivots into the holes. Yeah, looks all right. So while I assemble the base movement, uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, watchmaking as a hobby. A lot of uh, people start uh, their, let's say, watchmaking journey as a hobby. Uh, I did, for sure. I had an interest in uh, watches, actually from a 
pretty young age, but um, never really did anything about it until some 20 years ago when I started uh, getting a bit more serious about uh, collecting watches and also then started looking into uh, how they work, understanding that. And there is a fascination that you can sort of turn one piece one place and then have that motion transfer through a lot of small parts somewhere else. I think uh, a lot of people uh, are just fascinated by seeing wheels in action like that. And uh, everything with a watch is entirely and perfectly logical. Everything happens for a very clear reason. And everything also does not happen for a very clear reason. So for this watch, for instance, uh, the reason that the chronograph wasn't working was that the pivot uh, was broken. So the chronograph wheel would not uh, rotate properly. So when you're interested in uh, watchmaking as a hobby, um, I would, of course, recommend not to start with this watch. Maybe make this one like your second watch at least. The best watches to start with is uh, most likely something like a Psycho 5. And the reason I'm saying that is because uh, Psychos are very sturdy watches and they're quite cheap, the Psycho 5s. You can uh, find a uh, vintage Psycho 5 for uh, less than $100 in running condition. And actually making sure that you start working on watches in running condition is a really good idea. Because if you buy a watch that doesn't work and you don't uh, really have experience with uh, every little intricacy, then it's going to be very difficult to find out uh, if you can actually make it work or not. So getting a couple of uh, Psycho 5s, you can also do some uh, Russian watches, for instance, also cheap and sturdy or pocket watches for that sake, but pocket watches you're going to struggle finding parts for, so that's the, the downside to those. But if you start with that kind of movement, you're going to find uh, that it's uh, very logical, everything happens for a reason, and if you just do not ever use force on anything that uh, seems to not want to move, then you should be able to make a lot of progress uh, just by using your uh, brain and uh, screwdrivers and tweezers. Back to this movement, uh, let's uh, lubricate uh, the pallet stones. This is a low beat movement, 18,000 beats per hour. So uh, we can use uh, oil, we can also use grease if we like. But I'm using oil here, putting a little tiny drop on uh, the escape uh, pallet, or the exit pallet rather. Let's not mix the terms, the exit pallet. And then uh, that is going to be distributed over the escape wheel teeth. Like so. All right, time for the moment of truth. Let's get the balance in. Yeah, that looks uh, pretty all right. And don't worry about the balance stopping when I start tightening the screw. That's uh, completely normal. If it doesn't start running again when you have tightened the screw, then that is not uh, normal. We're going to oil the pivot holes. We oil uh, all the holes apart from uh, the pallet fork. Then we're going to demagnetize the movement before we are putting it on the time grapher. What the... Uh, well, it is running. Okay, amplitude, a little bit low. But uh, the beat uh, error is much too high. So let's uh, fix that first of all. Before we start fixing anything, it might be interesting also to uh, know why we want to fix it. So beat error is actually uh, the difference between the left swing and the right swing of the balance. 
If the beat there is very high, you can even hear the watch go tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, instead of tick tock, tick tock. And the reason it is not a good thing is because it will uh, reduce the amplitude. And also the watch will be more difficult to uh, start by itself. So we want to get the beat error down to about uh, one millisecond. The way to find out where to adjust it is by letting the power down and then see where the pallet fork uh, stops or where it, uh, let's say, leans towards. And then we can twist this collet on the balance staff just a tiny little bit. And then we can put it back on the balance cock and see if that helped. And uh, it did help on the beat error. You see the beat error is uh, much closer to acceptable. But I was not able to get uh, the rate closer to zero than 25 or around 20 uh, seconds. And the reason for that is uh, that the overcoil curve was not entirely correct. The thing with uh, Brigea overcoils is that uh, the index pins then catch on to the overcoil. And if the overcoil curve doesn't fit perfectly in between the index pins, the hairspring will always touch one of the pins and that will uh, make uh, the, the watch go faster. The way to see how the overcoil should curve is to uh, take the hairspring off the balance staff and then put it on top of the balance cock. Then you will see which of the, let's say, regular coils fit into the index pin uh, gap. In this case, that was uh, the third coil. So what we're going to have to do is to change the overcoil curve a little bit. And this is something you really don't want to do too much of too often, or actually, if you did it too often, then you would be better at it. But uh, this is kind of uh, open heart surgery in a moving truck while jumping out of a plane without the parachute. Additionally, uh, you might have seen before also that uh, the actual bend in the overcoil was not uh, completely good, so I also had to try to fix that. But luck favors the brave, so uh, ultimately I did manage to uh, get it uh, pretty good. We're happy with the amplitude. The beat there is ever so slightly high, but uh, that is uh, perfectly fine for this watch. So let's move on to the chronograph. Just going to check the clutch wheel and also uh, the intermediate minute counter wheel that they run freely. And then we can lubricate them before we uh, put in uh, the other parts. There are a lot of ways to skin that. Um, sorry. I keep uh, forgetting that. I have two cats, so I shouldn't say anything like that. There are many ways to do things. And there are many ways to uh, assemble a chronograph as well. This time we're starting with a column wheel. Then we kind of build the chronograph in layers. So there are some parts that go underneath others. Try to remember that at least. I do uh, forget that sometimes, so we'll uh, see a couple of parts that I probably should have put in a little bit differently, but that's uh, all right. The operating lever spring on this one is a little bit uh, strange, perhaps. It's important to get it into the right spot. Also important that this uh, joint on the operating lever is uh, lubricated. Otherwise uh, it might stick a little bit. So one of the big issues with the watch was of course the broken pivot on the chronograph wheel. So there are a couple of different ways to approach that. One is to take uh, the wheel apart into the five different uh, subparts, if you will. And then you could actually re-pivot the whole uh, arbor. But that's pretty fiddly and not really worth uh, the time. Plus, the pivot is so small that uh, it is also very uh, difficult. The other is, of course, to buy a new wheel. This wheel costs 165 francs. 
So that uh, hopefully also um, illustrates that old watches are very difficult to uh, get parts for. And when you do find them, you might have to pay quite a lot of money. But in this case, uh, there's not really any other option, uh, any viable other option at least. So uh, we go for it. It looks all right so far, but uh, there are a couple of issues with that wheel as well that we'll uh, get to later. First, let's get the driving wheel on. Goes on to the extended uh, fourth wheel pivot. And then uh, we can put the clutch on. And we see that uh, the watch stops when we put uh, the clutch in. And that probably means that the depth thing between the clutch wheel and the driving wheel is uh, too small so that it uh, gets too much friction. The way we fix that is by adjusting this uh, eccentric screw. An eccentric screw is uh, not a regular screw. It is uh, wider on one side than the other. So when you twist it, you're going to push a part away in one direction or the other. So in a chronograph, you always have a few of these eccentrics. And yes, we're going to have to adjust all of them in this one. A couple of the springs for these parts, like the spring for the brake and also uh, for the intermediate uh, minute counter wheel, can be a little bit tricky to get in place. There might be some better habits than uh, what I have in uh, doing so. But we got most of the parts for uh, the chronograph in place by now. So the action seems uh, smooth enough for now. Start and stop uh, looks okay. So then let's also put on the reset or the hammer with its uh, different parts. The hammer design on this movement uh, is a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say tricky, but it has its quirks. These two parts are uh, places where I'm uh, greasing now need to be pretty smooth because they actually force two other parts to uh, engage. One is the brake and the other is uh, the intermediate uh, minute wheel uh, counter. And if uh, those two contact points are not uh, greased, then you'll have a very hard and rough function of the reset. Last thing we need to get in place is this uh, jumper for uh, the minute wheel. And then we can test uh, that the start, stop and reset works. And while it works, there is a problem here with the reset. Can you see the problem? If so, then uh, pause the video and comment below. Because I'm going to show it now. We see that this uh, finger on the underside of the chronograph wheel flicks over the intermediate uh, minute uh, counter wheel just a few seconds after you start the chronograph. And maybe that counts for a minute in New York, but uh, not the uh, rest of the world. As you might remember, one of the parts of the chronograph wheel was this finger, and its friction fit onto the arbor of the chronograph wheel. So we can simply twist it. It's just a friction fit. And uh, with a couple of uh, tries, we should be able to get it into the right spot. We can do that in situ if uh, we already done it. I did the first adjustment uh, off camera. I was unfortunately not able to get it uh, in focus while I did it. See that is still not quite good. Need to move it a little bit more. And there it seems to be okay. Let's double check. Yeah. 
Ew. Note that with uh, twisting that finger, we also change the angle ever so slightly and uh, where it comes in contact with the intermediate uh, control wheel. So when I run it for one minute, we see that it doesn't actually flick the wheel over. Now, I didn't actually notice that uh, before starting casing the movement, but uh, it's not a problem. We can fix that later, of course. So let's uh, get back to uh, actually putting the movement back into the case so that we can uh, work on uh, the calendar side. And someone should work on their nose hair. That's a lot right there, man. Can make it like a nose hair wig out of that. Or maybe that is what it is. As I mentioned before, we are uh, using the case as a movement holder. And the reason that is uh, convenient is uh, because uh, the dial is screwed on from the underside. Otherwise it wouldn't be that convenient. With the movement secured in the case, we can uh, start uh, working on the calendar side. If you watch the Pierce uh, Triple Calendar Moon Face, you will uh, probably recognize a lot of the, the functions here. The Pierce one is a little bit more straightforward and it has uh, separate uh, pushers or correctors for uh, all of the different calendar functions. In this movement, there is a double function for uh, one of the pushers. We'll uh, get back to that. We'll uh, first just uh, finish off the hour counting mechanism. As with uh, most uh, hour counter chronographs, it is a creeping uh, hand. So it uh, moves uh, all the time. It doesn't flick over at any specific points. Um, the reason for that is that it's directly driven from the barrel. So as the barrel rotates, it uh, moves one of those pinions we just put in, and thereby also uh, the hour counter wheel. As we can see, it uh, moves back and forth as we uh, use the uh, operating lever to start stuff the chronograph. And that's how the engagement works for the hour counting mechanism. One uh, weakness with this uh, movement is uh, the wheel under that little bridge we just put on. It has very fine teeth. Those teeth can quite easily be damaged. That's something you find uh, sometimes in this movement. Another weakness is uh, this solution for the hour counter wheel. It is being held in place by this little uh, friction spring. That friction spring needs to be on top of that uh, steel base. That means that uh, the wheel gets a little bit sideways pressure. The reason why that can be an issue is uh, the part we're putting on here, which is uh, the hour hammer. With that sideways pressure on the hour counting wheel, it might dip just a little bit below a horizontal on uh, one side. And that could be enough to interfere with the action of the hammer. It's also a relatively complex uh, construction. I guess they had to fit it in a relatively small space, but uh, so it's quite ingenious, absolutely. But it is a bit prone to, uh, to problems. What we can see here is that uh, we cannot really reset. The reason for that is uh, what I mentioned before, that uh, we need to uh, slightly adjust the way the hour counter wheel is held down. And the other is that there is uh, also on uh, this hour hammer an eccentric. And that eccentric adjusts the depthing of the hammer action to the pusher. 
Now my stupid fingers got a little bit in the way of uh, the shot again, but uh, that is the eccentric. And by adjusting it, we can make an engagement of the, our hammer to the hour wheel a little bit uh, deeper or uh, shallower. In this case, deeper. That looks better. Okay. All right, time for uh, moving on to uh, the calendar works. We're going to put this big spring in before we put in uh, the pusher or the corrector rather. I think I'm going to start dyeing my nose hair. I was actually thinking green would fit with uh, the rest of my Hulk-like appearance, obviously. I mean, being a watchmaker, having to handle uh, metal parts all day, you do build up a certain uh, volume of muscles. have to use it for something, you know, other than uh, endlessly spanking the kids. Anyway, there are a couple of uh, driving wheels uh, for uh, the calendar. The position of those little pins on top of the wheels uh, will determine which wheels turn over at what time. I did not uh, change uh, that. I basically just used the same position as uh, it was in when I disassembled uh, the watch. But uh, if you want to make sure that one of the wheels change over before the other, for instance, then uh, you have to move those wheels around a little bit so that the pins uh, are in different positions uh, relative to each other. So we're putting on all the different jumpers and springs first. Then we're going to put in the corrector as well for uh, the weekday and uh, the month. So you might remember that uh, the weekday corrector was missing. And this is uh, the part. When the watch was produced, you could probably get this part for like uh, $2 uh, or something. And now it costs uh, 90 That uh, little hole uh, oil there is uh, where this pin on uh, the month corrector fits in. And the action is that when the corrector is uh, pushed, a deep action will change the weekday and a shallow action will change the month. One common question for uh, triple calendar watches is uh, does the month change over automatically? And in general, the answer is no. And hold on, hold on, before you tear out all your hair and break all the plates in your house, it isn't actually that bad. Because even if the month did change over automatically after uh, the 31st, there would still be five months out of the 12 where you would need to uh, set it manually. Because there are months uh, that do not have 31 days, and then you would have to do it uh, by yourself. All right, time to get the discs in place. We see on the underside of the month disc, we have the 12 tooth star wheel. Hmm, wonder why there's 12. We need to make sure that uh, the jumper and the corrector is not in the way before we screw down uh, the wheel. And then we can uh, repeat the action on uh, the weekday side. You see on the other side there, we have a star wheel with seven teeth. While I finish up that, I wanted to just make a few more comments on this uh, topic of uh, watchmaking as a hobby. It's really a good time for uh, learning watchmaking if you uh, want to do so. There are so many good uh, resources online, uh, on YouTube obviously. Um, do make sure that you buy good tools. Don't buy cheap tools. They will just frustrate you. And good tools you will have for a lifetime, basically. So uh, if you pay double for them, it's really, really worth it. 
and you don't need a lot of tools to begin with. There are some good videos out there that uh, say uh, what kind of tools you need to like a starter kit kind of thing. And you should get away uh, with a few hundred dollars for a starter kit more or less. But don't buy actual kits, buy proper tools. All right, we got uh, the dial back on. And yes, the dial is worn. And no, there's nothing we can do about it. Dials are very, very fragile. Pretty much as uh, fragile as a newly painted house during a pollen season. So if you try to do anything uh, with an old dial like this, the chances are very close to 100% that you will mess it up. And the reason for that is that the top layer of the dial is uh, varnish, so a kind of a uh, lacquer. And that is uh, intended to uh, protect the paint underneath and also the printing. And while it of course does that, it also does accumulate dirt and dust and all kinds of stuff over the years. And over the years that kind of merges with the varnish. So it's not on top of the varnish anymore. And that is why it's a problem to uh, do anything about it. Because once you start rubbing on a dial like this, you will rub the varnish off. Under the varnish you have uh, the paint, you have the lettering, that kind of thing. And all of a sudden the dial does not look uniform anymore. And it might even uh, remove things you really don't want to remove, like uh, the lettering. So for old dials like this, there's really only two options. One is to keep it. And I think in this case, it's a very easy choice to keep this dial. I think it's beautiful. Or you could refinish it. And no, there is no third option of finding a replacement dial. That is just not going to ever be possible. Let's get back to this discussion in a little while. I just want to uh, find another problem with the chronograph. See the reset does not uh, really work as it should, even though it did before. So what happened? Well, the issue when you don't have a movement holder with support on the jewel on the underside is that sometimes when you press on the second hand or the chronograph second hand in this case, you can push the jewel out of its position. And that's what happened here. We see that the hammer catches slightly on top of the chronograph wheel. To fix that, we use a jeweling tool. It has this spring-loaded pusher in the center that fits into the jewel hole. And that allows us to uh, perfectly center the tool on the jewel. And then we can gently press the jewel in the direction we want to. And for this jewel, we want to lower it a little bit because it has been pushed a little bit up, if you will. We can, of course, not really measure how much we need to adjust this by. So we're going to just play that by ear. Trying it again, we see that it uh, does seem to work better now. And yes, the second hand is misaligned a little bit. So I'm going to take that off and uh, fix it off camera. And yes, there's a stutter in the second hand as well, the chronograph second hand. So that's another problem that we have to fix. Let's just make sure the reset works before we look at another problem. And that seems okay. So the problem with the stutter can either be this uh, friction spring on the underside of the chronograph wheel, or it can be the depth thing between a couple of uh, the wheels. So I adjusted uh, both of those. And then we can proceed with uh, the small hands. Let's see then. Let's speed it up a little bit. We also remember that uh, the minute didn't jump over as it should, so uh, I hopefully also fixed that. All right, that looks okay.
And let's speed things up a bit so we can see that the hour counter also moves. And let's try a last reset before we can put the crystal back on. Yeah, that looks all right. Probably not a surprise that I uh, got a new crystal. I'm not showing how to uh, put that in now. It's already a very long video. But there are quite a few other videos you can uh, watch to uh, see how to do that if you're uh, curious. And there we have it. Before seeing the watch on the wrist, I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, at vintagewatchservices.eu you can find more than 100 watches in really nice condition. So check that out if you're uh, looking for a beautiful vintage watch. All right. There's the watch on the wrist. I think it's a beautiful watch. Yes, the case is uh, certainly uh, beyond its best days. And the dial is uh, not entirely uh, great, but uh, to me, this is a beauty. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then uh, clicking like and subscribe will certainly help the channel. We'll be back with another video shortly. Until then. Ta-ta. <laughs>